What's up, people? GNR TV, streaming done right. It has all the channels that you would want. You know, the regular channels, channels from out of state, pay-per-views, sports, the movie channels, porn. It has over 2,000 channels in general. Over 2,000 channels. $20 a month for two devices now. Not one, but two devices for 20 bucks, and you get all that amazing stuff. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, there's no sports right now. There's not really many pay-per-views. Well, guess what? There is sports because UFC is back. And there's pay-per-views because guess what? UFC is back, and the rest of the sports will be back eventually, and it's worth it. This app is freaking amazing. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I've had it for a little over a year now. I'm never going to get rid of it, and I love it. I love it so much. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, you need to get it. And enjoy the rest of the show. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Station's How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? I got the awesome Derek Hebert, who got to make this beautiful documentary with Kane Hodder. Derek, how's it going, man? It's going well, uh, do, as well as it can be during the craziness that is this quarantine time we're in right now. But things are going well. Happy to hear that, and I'm with you on that. It's it's so crazy because you ne- like I never thought my wildest dreams would be in a, a situation like this to where we have to stay stuck at home. I mean, as far as like unless you're an essential worker, you're stuck at home, which I'm not essential, but I'm lucky enough that I work for the state, so they're paying me to stay home and. I can't argue that. I'm like, oh, okay. I'll stay home. So I've been recording. Like, I think you're my, I know I'm in the thirties as far as since this whole quarantine thing has been going on. I'm in the thirties as far as how many episodes I've recorded since then. Cause I feel this is one of those times. This is, this is the perfect time for us people who have to stay home for whatever reason. And to work on your craft, work on your passion. If it's, especially if it's something you can do from home, just practice at it, work at it, or, For us married guys, you know, your wife's been telling you to do these projects for the past eight years. You have no excuses. Like, I don't have, we have plenty of time to do those now. Not trying to throw any guys under the bus, but I'm just saying, like, there's, there's times to do all that kind of stuff. The passions, if you want to start a podcast, a YouTube channel, some sort of creator. If you want to write a script, if you're something, you know, you've never done that before. You want to try to do a movie, shoot something simple on your, a little quarantine movie on your phone. If you don't have, you know, the camera and the equipment, now is the best time. Now's the right time to do that kind of stuff. And See if it's something you really want to do, and if it is, you know, and it's something you're passionate about, why not? No, I completely agree. I've been I've been trying to get uh, some other projects that I've been working on for a while, kind of moving along during this, mm-hmm. uh, as well as I did. Um, Roger Corman did his uh, uh, two two minute quarantine film festival, so I did do uh, filming that that I launch post it on social media and everything just two minutes dusted off my acting chops for the first time in 12 years i actually acted again and then um i've also been practicing and learning uh the art of magic as well during this time really? like actually like yeah like cards and all that kind of stuff because i've always been fascinated by it and i wanted to by the end of i started before this happened mm-hmm. like about two two months before but i want by the end of this crazy quarantine when things start getting back to be able to actually start performing it as opposed to being you know taking because normally what i've learned in this period of time would have taken months and months and months of once a week yeah having a small lesson and then you know after 40 hours a week of working taking time to practice now there's just nothing but time my my day job is probably not going to be starting up again because i work at universal studios hollywood here in um california uh, and you know as a theme park it's probably unfortunately not going to be one of the first things that opens up mm-hmm. just thinking about logically um yeah. it's mass gatherings of people 
So I'm think you know, that'll probably be one of the later things to open up, which is good in some ways, because obviously we don't want this to come back again. Exactly. They're saying that if we open up too early, there's a chance it could come back with a vengeance in the winter. And that's the last thing any of us want. Like after going through this, we should take the time to get through it right the first time so that we can, when we open back up, we know that it's not going to come mm-hmm. back. I agree with you there. Not, not only that, but I hope once this whole pandemic is over, instead of things going back to normal, I want things to go back to better than normal. And by that, I mean, like, yes, I still want to go to the movies. Yes, I still want to go do those things we've done before. But as far as people, like, I think we need to come out of this better and treat each other better and treat Agreed. the earth better. Treat the earth better. Because I feel like the earth has given it, like, a given us, which I know there's more to it, but given us, like, a big screw you. Because if you look around, like, you're watching stuff, just looking, doing research on, you know, doing the internet and all that stuff, just watching a few things, you see that a lot of places around the world, like the earth, because we haven't been tearing it up, have been like coming back. Plants have been coming back, some animals. And it's just like, the earth is just like, yes, I can finally breathe. Because <laughs> you guys... No, yeah, I, I think we definitely need to like take a look at things big picture and try to figure out a lot of these things again. Like where, you know, we fit in and, and other things as well. Like, I, I think... There'll be a new there'll be a new normal at least for a while, mm-hmm. um, for sure. But I'm 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 I remain optimistic that things will get back uh, get back to at least maybe uh, hopefully like you said a better normal though. Hopefully yeah. we can make it so that we're still able to do all these things, but maybe at least appreciate them more. At the mm-hmm. very least, appreciate them more and be willing to spend. Like the last thing I want is for our, the people like me who are, you know, theme park people, the people who are, like, I've been doing, like, some food delivery type stuff. Uh And if you, you know, the people at the grocery stores, the people at these places, how much we're relying on them now, uh, the last thing I want is for these same uh, people who are fighting for them to get um, increased wages right now to then shoot down minimum wage increases and things like that. Mm-hmm. Like, no, if they, if they're essential workers, then, I, and they're going to be required to work during these pandemics, we need to make sure that they're being, that people are being taken care of. And, you know, maybe this is a, a wake up call for, for a lot of things. Uh, you know, some of the changes in the film industry that are happening, that sounds like are sounds, sound great. And like theme park and all that, like, I think the idea of having increased cleaning, the increased um, monitoring of things is never a bad thing. I agree. As long as we can, um, you know, and I think just having a better emergency task force in general, I think it's woken us up that we need some kind of emergency preparedness plan in place because, um, you know, if it ha- obviously this is the first time something like this has happened, but it could happen again. We don't know. Mm-hmm. And I think it's better to be safe than, than sorry again. You know, mm-hmm. Universal, just going back to that, just because it, it's a place I know, it's been, we've literally never closed for a day since wow. that theme park opened until now. Like, even like 9-11 and when the major fire broke out, it was down for like half a day. Wow. And now it's been two months. <clears throat> and it's crazy. likely to continue. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of crazy. And a lot of people are, you know, are worried about things like obviously Halloween, the horror conventions, like yeah. pretty much 2020s written off for a lot of the things that us horror fans and filmmakers take for granted. Film festivals, horror conventions, all that kind of stuff are kind of done, but it's what, like next year, hopefully we, we remember that and we're not much more willing to go out and once the economy recovers, uh, support the people at these places and the artisans and all that that you know not everyone's able to support right now agreed and going back to what you're saying about the essential workers i personally feel that they should be getting some sort of hazard pay or something from here on like agreed. right now and then after you know say they get hazard pay through the pandemic and then i feel like they should get an, they should each get an increased pay after this is over that's like a steady pay because this corona thing from what we're hearing about how dangerous it is and how you should stay at home. And if you have to go out to say, get groceries or you have, you know, you have to go out to do these things or you have, or you're one of the people who have to go to work. You're putting yourself at risk. You're putting yourself at risk. 
and then you're also putting other like others are going to become at risk for like for me for example i haven't seen my father in like a couple months just because of since this has been going on because my father's like 75 76 years old great health and all that but i don't yeah, the last thing you want to do exactly the last thing you want to do that's the same my parents have seen my grandmother and uh but she's 80, so they, they see her, you know, they'll go over six feet away, they'll hang out, you know, they'll go on walks, walking apart, just so that they get to see each other. But, like, yeah. um, it's hard because, obviously, she wants nothing more than, and they want nothing more than to give each other a goodbye hug or have a, a meal together, you know, in the house. But, like, it, it makes sense. It, nobody wants to get, nobody wants to get this. Nobody wants to be sick. And mm-hmm. I think in some ways we're proving that we as a society can get through these kind of things. And um, the fact that we're not, uh, many of us are not being selfish. <laughs> yes. Yes. Cause there there's is- obviously those uh, protesters who oh are and- being a bunch of fools, but um, on both on every side, like people do the idea of like open up it now. Like obviously there is a point, where the economy has to come into play at some point, but it's just, it's not, it, <laughs> when, it, when the numbers keep going up, it's not there. Like I know we're never going to get to a perfect point where there's no cases of it. Oh no. And we can't wait for there to be no cases in order to open up the economy or we're going to be dead. But like, we also can't, as the numbers keep climbing, be like, let's open everything up. That's yeah. Great- because the then part. it's gonna it, exactly what I said before. Then yeah, maybe it'll we get better for a little while. Like it'll seem better, and then we got yeah. Winter is dead, and then all the businesses are are even worse off. Mm-hmm. Getting this tiny bit of time in the middle isn't helpful if uh, they're not able to survive long term. Exactly, and I mean, yes, it does suck that you have to stay home, but. At the same time, again, if you have to go to the store to grab some, even if you have to go to say like Home Depot to grab leaf bags or, or go to the store to grab some projects that you can do at home, you still have you could still do that. Just be smart about it. Where exactly. You- I have my I buy my mask, and even when I do some deliveries, I I you know whenever I go anywhere, I have it in the car. I don't wear it in the car like yeah, honestly, like a fool because I think it's kind of foolish if I'm in the car by myself to wear the mask, but. As soon as before I get out of the car to go in the store, the restaurant, or wherever I'm going, put I always put it on and, and keep it on until I'm back in the car with doors shut and then yeah. I can take it off. But like, you got to be smart about it. But if I need something, I'll go out and get it. Oh, yeah. um, but like, I've been doing like grocery shopping every two weeks and stuff. I've been trying to <laughs> not go out quite as often just because, like, when it first started, nobody knew what was going on. And I was one of those firm people who was like, this is stupid. We should go. I you know, was trying to convince people to go on a trip with me because I was like, you know, airfare is really cheap. Hotels are really cheap. We should do something. And then thank God um, I decided to wait a couple of days because I wanted to go to Vegas. And literally the day I was going to leave Vegas shut down completely. Oh. And that would have been a very lame trip to Vegas if I had left a day early. <laughs> and I would have been putting myself in unnecessary yep danger knowing what we know now about it at the time we knew so little because it's been this like thing where we keep learning new information Mm -hmm. you know what i knew it was really really serious is when all the sporting events were shut down and i say that because not because i'm a sports fan but because that's billions and billions of dollars like you you think about it because at first they were talking about what the nba at at the very you know in the very beginning of they're saying they were going to have games with zero fans in the stadiums that's a lot of money because you got to think of ticket sales. You got to think of concession sales, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Is a ton of freaking money. And it was yeah, like, and then all of a sudden it started, uh, that happened. And then all Broadway shuttered, which is unheard of. And mm-hmm. then Vegas started like Cirque du Soleil went dark. And then all the magicians went dark. And then all the, everything just, it was like this trickle down of like, okay, it's now like, now even like the movie theater, like I went to see a movie on like the last day that I could. And it was, you know, we had to sit three seats apart from one another. And it was like very like planned, similar to how it sounds like it's going to be when it opens back up. But, you know, that's like the last thing I did in a public situation was like went to a movie because 
very few people were going and I was like, uh, plus, I'm, you know, sitting so far away from people that I knew I'd be okay. But then when the movie theaters, that's the thing that really got, I didn't think the movie theaters would, would close. Yeah. I thought they would do a very targeted, you know, six feet apart approach. But then, especially in California, it became, you know, we're right now in, uh, like shutter in place mentality. I think mm-hmm. that's what it's called or shelter in place. Meaning like they don't want us going out for any non-essential reason for any reason, like no, like everything shut down certain places across. They're slowly opening things up. California is like a lockdown. Yeah. We're still weeks away from anything beyond essential businesses being open because we want to make sure uh, that we get this thing dealt with. <laughs> Which makes plenty of sense. I mean, it's 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 one of those things where yes, it sucks, but at the same time, it's like just list if people just listen, you know. We'll, well yeah, no, I agree, and that's why I was excited to and uh, eager to do uh, something, you know, to promote uh, the documentary and and stuff because they're available to watch, and it gives people something to to do that's different than they, you know. There's a million things on Netflix and all those other distribution platforms but uh i think some of the projects i was lucky enough to either create or be a part of creating are unique enough where i think they deserve people to you know watch them and and if they haven't heard about them until now it's a great time to be able to check out a lot of these more independent and uh different than mainstream films given that there's not a whole lot of films out there to watch like main street there's no movies in the theaters coming out no i get i get exactly what you mean and i guess with that what you saying that is a great segue into (laughs) these and i'm actually going to start with this can we watch yeah i didn't hear about this until you sent it to me the other day i mean the picture of it and all that yeah it's that film was there inside it's a a found footage horror thriller um that i i was a producer on it um from the very beginning, uh, I was one of the four producers on it, and it is a it's a great movie. It's sort of like The Strangers meets uh, Funny Games, so it's very uh, very eerie, very unique um, story of two sisters who go out in the middle of the woods into a house that they win in a contest to be able to shoot a passion project film. When they begin to get targeted by killers who are creating a passion project of their own oh so it's a i i think that one i i'm very proud of that this movie um again was less involved given that i was just a producer on it than telling back where i was <laughs> in the trenches for that entire process uh there inside i was there every day of filming i <clears throat> participated heavily and i am very proud of it but you know it's a different beast Altogether, but it is this one's on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's exactly here in the U.S. Um, awesome. And no, I really I think it's a great project. I definitely recommend picking up with either of them the Blu-ray though, just because like with the doc, there's um, eight ninety minutes of deleted scenes on there, mm-hmm. and with the 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 uh, there inside there's two commentaries and stuff on there as well. So like I think it's just a very unique kind of a both of them are unique films and their inside has a lot of great practical effects we you we worked with soda effects the team uh, behind um children of the corn and a whole lot of other classic Mm -hmm. movies they worked with kane on um a death house uh that he did fairly recently and stuff and that's how we kind of got to know them is um we were when working on the documentary we went to their studios and, and film there. And then later on when we were looking for effects people for their inside, we contacted them and Roy, who owns them, is just such a eager and excited kind of guy who was willing to work within, you know, their inside especially was a, mm-hmm. was a micro budget movie. So we were able to really work um, out a great, um, value of effects and we did some really cool stuff with it and the masks that we created for the villains to wear are originals uh they're custom made just for this movie uh nowhere else in the world 
That's do you awesome. see anything, any masks that are exactly the same as these? Um, because we were able to have them, and they did create the masks for the strangers, but also um, for a lot of other products, like Sinister. They did all the effects for Sinister too. So, like, um, we knew they could e easily create the kind of quality stuff we needed, and mm -hmm. they were just so much fun to work with too. Like, I, I personally love practical effects. Digital's great, and we use digital in there inside as well. But I think what works wonderful with them is the, you know, the merging of the two, mm -hmm. having a beautiful practical effect and a digital transition and digital comp compositions and digital elements only in increase how amazing it works. But then there's, you know, there's obviously a lot of examples of thing reboot and everything um, where the studio took it a step too far with, with digital instead of practical where we really heavily relied on practical and only used digital as a as like a, a nice transition tool or a bonus or to help composite and make it even look better. But we never did anything to replace uh, the beautiful practical effects we made. We only did it to enhance them. See, now that, that's what I like to hear. That's what I love to hear. And that's how my logic in general when it comes to this kind of stuff is. Like, I love... Like both, all of these films were shot digitally. Um, I'd love to shoot on film, but um, so far they've all been shot digitally, but with sort of an analog mind with a lot of the steps. It's like mm -hmm. how we were going about it was very much from a perspective of we're creating films. We never really wanted to create like a digital file. We wanted to create something for the theater. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's why with both of them, like the aspect ratio and everything, and the, and the way it's framed is designed to be watched in a theater. So when you watch it at home, they're, they're movies. They're not yeah. um, like made for TV movies, which are fine, but it's the idea of it was uh, very different. Mm -hmm. No, I like it. And before I forget, I have to get both of these movies and I have to get you to sign both of these, both of these projects. I think they're both awesome. And you're a part of both of them, so I'd love to have you sign them both. No, of course. And I got to get I, – I have to meet Kane again so I can have him sign to Helen back because that – No, Kane – I'm sure once this whole thing's over, Kane will be back – At the cons. With a vengeance at the cons. He – I'm sure he's going a little stir-crazy right now too. He he loves meeting fans and, and going out and, and working. And, like, all the film stuff has stopped too. And I think he – he would want nothing more than to uh, to go out and promote it. And that's why like him and I have been talking about working together again and doing Ooh. different stuff because we want to, um, you know, we want to jump back into things as well. We're both eager to get out there and start making projects again. That I can't wait to see. Now I, I did see, it was, this was a couple of weeks ago, I believe I did see one. Um, they did like an online con type of deal. Where you can have, I guess you can have meetings with, you know, some of the celebrities and all that stuff, which I, which I yeah. thought was cool. And I wouldn't, I don't want it to go that way in the future, but like for now, while this whole thing is going on, I think it'd be a pretty cool thing. You know, you get to sit down with the celebrities. Yeah. And Kane did that. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I know he was part of that first one. Cause I know the guys that did, uh, the, the, uh, the Indie Brigade did one of them. Yeah, the Indie Brigade. And I know Joe, Joe over there, Joe Ridgely, I know him pretty well. Mm -hmm. I've done his podcast a couple times and he, um, I was excited about the idea of, of that. And right now they're doing one where they're auctioning off um, phone calls and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's brilliant. I think it's a brilliant idea to kind of do these things for now, at least. Um, yeah. It's sort of the same idea as like the auctioning off like a, uh, a, a 30 minute in person thing or having dinner with, with Kane at a convention or, or have drinks with, you know, Felissa Rose, but it's now what, what can he do? How about a Skype call, a Zoom call, or a phone call, you know, do something. And then maybe at the end, you know, they mail you a signed 8 by 10 that kind of a thing. Yep. Where it's, a little, it's a little different. A lot of them are doing that too, where they have like, even the ones that normally didn't now are offering autograph stuff on their websites because they understand horror fans still are excited about the materials and them and they want to support them. And yes. even if they can't see them in person, they would love to 
go out and, you know, exactly. promote them. Exactly. It, and it's one of those things where, like, again, for now, I hope it happens, and I would like to be a part of one of those as far as, you know, getting to talk to celebrities and yeah. getting a couple autographs. Me too. I would love to uh, do it. I've been trying to – I've been talking to a few of them about doing – like I'd love to do a panel with Kane and and talk about the the documentary again. I I miss going out and promoting. It. That's why I was excited, you know, jump on this because like obviously once a film comes out um, and you do promotions, it doesn't. It's not always like right. You know, always keep up that momentum and you know life gets in the way and everything. But especially with the launch of Tell and Back on Shutter, it's like it is a perfect opportunity to go out again and like republicize the fact that this movie exists because not as many people have seen it as I think should. Like, I, I think it truly is a human interest and horror documentary oh, that yeah. people need to see that aren't just, even if you don't like horror films, Kane isn't, Kane isn't just a horror guy. He is like, he's been through stuff that can relate to anybody. Oh yeah. He's, he's great. And I remember watching this documentary with my wife, we were watching on Amazon prime and just watching the story. I got a little choked up. I didn't start crying, but I got a little choked up. Like, you know, you get that little thing in your throat. But you, yeah. As guys, we just, we don't talk for a second. You just get something to drink or kind of swallow air so you don't start crying. And my wife was like teary-eyed just by watching his story because he goes through so much. Yeah, I still get emotional watching the documentary. I mean, I haven't, to be <laughs> fair, I have not watched it in a little while. I've actually been meaning to watch it again. But, you know, when I was the assistant editor on it and, I would watch cut of this cuts of this movie twice a day for a big for four months. We watched like two cuts of this movie every single day as we got this thing ready, and then you know you, the movie comes out and it screens a bunch of places, and you do Q and A's. And for a couple, for many of them, I actually would watch it, and then at a certain point, I got where like I could literally set a stopwatch and then go and grab like a bite to eat and come back about 20 minutes before it was over and be able to go up there and like, you know, just because like, you know, I know this movie so yeah. well, oh, yeah. but I, I, I'm very proud of it. And I do want to, I have been meaning to sit down again and, and watch it just because I just feel like um, it's time now. Like it's been a few, it's been like probably a year since I've actually watched the whole thing and I need to, um, you know, I just want to watch it again. <laughs> oh no, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that because it was, it was, like, a, it was. You know, I mean, I'm a person who loves documentaries anyway, and then for it to be a horror document, well, not horror, but you know, horror. It's yeah, it's. A horror I always say it's, it's horror adjacent, where it's a, it's a horror. It's about a horror icon, and it's there are a lot of horror references and movies and stories mm -hmm. in it, and then. That's why I always say it's a horror and human interest documentary because I think both it's equal parts both, so that the horror fans can appreciate it even if they don't give a, a crap about is the bullying and the burn, they can still appreciate all of the stories about it. But you oh, know yeah. that's what the Blu-ray. Why I always talk about that is like if you, the horror fans especially there are ninety minutes of bonus footage on here, a lot of movie stuff because. If it didn't pertain to Kane and his story exactly, uh, we cut it from the movie to keep the runtime down and to keep it all focused on him mm -hmm. and his story. But we have, you know, I, we had 38 hours, I think, of footage of just Kane. That's amazing. Plus a million. Um, uh, so to cut it down to this, I think, well, I, I think well paced and film um that doesn't feel long i think it really it took a lot of time it, <laughs> and there are a lot of things in the bonus footage that i wish was still in the movie uh but that's why i was happy to be able to put it on to the uh the blu-ray because yeah. at least people get to see it yeah, people I, get to see this footage i definitely have to get the blu-ray of that and, and get it signed like i said because i think that's just Again, it was so awesome. And then you're saying that there's 90 more minutes of material to watch. I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I got to get it. And any, I feel any other horror fan, Kane Hodder fans especially, but any other horror fan should definitely get it. And I got to meet Kane once, one time at a con so far. I was in New Jersey. And I remember I was in line. I'm waiting in line. And I'm, my brother, him and his wife had just had a, their first son. 
So he couldn't he couldn't come out there with us. So it was me and my wife and the, the kids. And so we're waiting in line, and I'm talking to my wife, and I'm texting my brother. I'm like, hey, what do you want signed? you want, like, an 8 by 10 or do you want a machete? And he's just – he didn't respond, so I called him. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, what, what, what's taking so long to respond? He's like, I'm over here thinking about what I want him to say on it. I was like, yo, Jason had no lines. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, like, you get something signed. They say something. He's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So he, we, end, we both end up getting machete signed. But I get up to Kane, and I swear to you, have you ever been to Monster Mania in New Jersey? I have not, but I've heard about it. I've heard how good it is. I haven't had a chance to go, but I hear it's a good convention. It's a huge convention. I only went two times, but um, anyway, it was like the convention's in this, I guess it's in a conventional part of the hotel or whatever. And Bam Marger, I shit you not, this sounds made up, walks in from like outside to come into the convention. <laughs> into the room and Kane sees him walking in and he's like, can you please hang on one minute? I want to go over there and choke Bam. And he went over there, talked to him for a minute and choked him. So everybody took pictures and he came back, shook my hand, talked to me for a minute, you know, cause there's other people in line. They're, they started coming in line. Like after that sign, what I want him to sign, which I thought was great. And that's not even the best part. That's not even the funniest part. Later on, I go to the bathroom. I'm in the stall using the bathroom. A couple minutes later, I hear Kane Hodder's voice. And I guess I guess he's at the urinal. I don't know if he was really standing by somebody or not. And I just all I hear is nice cock. But it was Kane saying this. I was trying to hold it. I was laughing, but I was trying not to like laugh too loud. So I get the first thing I did was like you know I leave the bathroom, get up to stall, wash my hands, and all that stuff. And I call my brother and tell him that, and he just started dying. I was like, yo, that's the funniest freaking thing. And it's no just Kane hard. is Kane is very fun at at conventions. We were lucky enough to go to them while well, shooting the doc, but I've also, you know, gone with him, gone to them that he's been at since. And he is just, he's there pretty much from the minute the convention starts until the, till sometimes an hour plus after it ends, mm -hmm. he will finish his line. There are people who refuse people to get in line at a certain point, not in a mean way, but like, um, get it though. they'll say like, Oh, how long they'll estimate that the line's an hour long and there's an hour left to the convention. So they close the end of the line off. Like no one can get in right now. Um, that's sort of how it like, yeah. So like, but Kane doesn't do that. So Kane will be at the one monster Palooza here in California. I witnessed it now two years in a row where he'll literally be the last person there with a line like it'll be wrapping around and he'll sit there for it was like they were literally all the vendors were packed up mm -hmm. the, the the company who was next to him packed up everything was packed up except for they literally walked the line and asked everyone what they wanted and left that exact number out and packed everything else up of kane's table and like everything it was like it was a very interesting thing because I don't think I've ever seen um, literally like the security from the convention, like escorting people one by one out because the hall was closed to everybody else. But that's Kane. Kane and Kane would not have accepted if they said to him, no, you can't meet with these people. Kane would have said, no, I am. Yeah. Like, which just shows you the kind of person he is. And that's, that's nothing against any of the other celebrities. Cause I, oh, not at all. Yeah. I get, I understand that 100% because I know a lot of them do have flights to where they have a con, you know, another, a week or two later. So like, I got to go home, you know, stretch my legs for a little bit and then go to this next. Yeah, and sometimes it's literally, they leave that they leave from there. I remember uh, Tate Steinsick, literally him and I were talking, we were going to, uh, I think grab a bite to eat or something and then, and catch up. And he, his assistant said, actually, Tate, your flight leaves in 45 minutes. And they had to end up rescheduling the flight because he stayed too long at the convention and mm -hmm. his flight was leaving out of LAX. And he was in Burbank or Pasadena at this convention. There was no way he would have been able to make it uh, to his convention in time. But he, yeah. he didn't care. Like he, They rescheduled it. But he was going off to film a movie like to do effects on a film, but like that's people like, yeah, Kane and Kane is usually also one of those people. He likes to get places early and stay a little bit later because of, you know, he just some of PTSD things, but mostly just because, you know, 
he doesn't want to travel just for two days anymore. Mm-hmm. And I can't blame him. I wouldn't want to travel just for two. I wouldn't want to fly somewhere on a, you know, when we were filming the doc, sometimes we would fly in on like a Friday or Friday morning and leave Sunday night. And, you know, I think moving forward, I'd be flying in on Thursday and leaving Monday, <laughs> like yep. at least give, give some time to, you know, cause when you're flying places that you want to just settle in too. Mm -hmm. i bet i bet now with um yeah i I agree with that actually i mean it's a little different for me because i've never i've flown one time in my life but uh as far as like when we go to cons now what i'll do is you know the cons are friday saturday sunday i'll take that thursday off and we'll make sure we have everything ready thursday friday's the double check we'll be we'll be off from that thursday to that monday because you're coming home sunday and it's like that monday you get a day to just relax before you get back to the world which freaking helps so much because there was a couple there was a couple times where we would just go especially if it was just me and my brother going before he moved out to colorado we'd go say we say we'd go to this con called scarecom we go there on like a friday stay till sunday and then you know you're going back to work monday yes mind you it's only a two-hour drive but still it's just you know what it is too it's the excitement it's the excitement that whole weekend i guess it's kind of like how kids are on christmas maybe more so when we were kids how christmas was as a kid and you're so excited when you get, the, you know, you get the Christmas and then you get that Christmas vacation and you're on that high for that whole week. And then boom, back to school. And for us, it's just those three days of that con. And then it's like, boom, back to the no, no, I understand what you mean. Like, um, yeah, I, I completely understand. I'm a big theme park guy. So like for me, it's, you know, I'll do these things where, cause SeaWorld is only like, it's like four hours away, mm-hmm. uh, three, three and a half, four hours away. So I'll sometimes go down to San Diego for the for the day just to go there. Mm-hmm. And it's gotten to the point now where I'm like, I should probably, if I'm going to do that, spend a night in a hotel because it's fine to drive. I'm perfectly fine driving down there, spending the entire day at a theme park. But driving back, that like the last time I did it was in January. Uh, I went on a cruise down there. So like in Long Beach. So like I, we went to... Um, SeaWorld on, I forget what day it was, I think a Thursday, uh, and then Friday the cruise left, mm-hmm. um, something like that. I don't think it was that, I don't think that was right at all. I think we went, no, we went on a Sunday to SeaWorld, and then Monday through Thursday was the um, cruise. So um, that was much better, though, because SeaWorld is down here, and then Long Beach is here, and Cal- LA is up there so Mm -hmm. we went down here drove back up to long beach uh stayed the night at a hotel there and then in the morning drove to the cruise so it was much like even though we had like a two-hour drive after a day at a theme park at least it wasn't a four-hour drive yeah and And at least was a little bit better we were right there by where the cruise was and we were able to uh you then drive over there because that's also a lot of the same as what you're talking about Mm-hmm. Um, just a, yeah just a, just driving alone gets freaking tiring and frustrating yeah as you do know and i'm sure it's even crazier out there with your california traffic or la traffic right yeah la traffic is crazy <laughs> uh, i'm not eager for that to start up again because it hasn't been um bad at all lately and i live um i live uh kind of uh away from the valley i are in the valley but sort of like i live in ventura county so um it's sort of north west of la so like i have a 45 minute drive to work uh on a good day to for my day job so right now i haven't ventured into that realm at all because why would i drive all the way over there during a quarantine time. Um, but after this, again, it's going to start back up. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So what got you, um, like who or what got you into the genre of horror as a fan? And what's the first movie that scared you when you were a kid? If, if any. Oh yeah. Movie as a kid, a lot of them scared me. Um, Beetlejuice. I remember scaring me even like I wasn't into horror as much. People always laugh about this, but until college college really got me into horror and it was uh my cinematographer actually and one of my good friends zach hunter 
who really got me into horror. Um, him and I were friends and then eventually roommates. Uh, and we, he showed me Hatchet um, with Kane. He showed me so many other films. And that is really what like invigorated the horror. I've always enjoyed like Halloween and all that other stuff, but I've never, yeah. I wasn't quite as into it as like some of, I go to conventions, I see these kids and I'm so happy for them that they're into it. Like, some people are like, oh, their parents for showing them these movies. No, if a kid can differentiate between fiction and nonfiction, then it's fine for them to see a I lot agree. of things. I agree. Now, you know, and, and we're also a country that's very heavily censored compared to others. So I think sometimes we have to take that into account as well. The U.S. tends to censor a lot of things that other countries wouldn't. Um, fake violence and something like a hatchet or a or a, you know, is is different than like Cannibal Holocaust or Green Inferno. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't think about showing my kids that one of those, but like Hatchet or or um, you know, one of the or, you know, see like Terrifier. I probably wouldn't, or even there inside. Like if it's psychological, it's different. But like Friday the Thirteenth, Nightmare on Elm Street, those kind of movies are a lot more. I think easily easily explainable to kids than okay. something psychological. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I'd love to see if there are studies about it, but I would, I would, um, yeah, I would definitely show my kids a lot of the things that Kane has been in if they're interested in it, if that's what interests them. But for me, it was college and first movie that scared, I would have to say would probably be something like Beetlejuice, honestly. And then, but now, um, not a lot scares me in movies. Mm -hmm. um, the Conjuring and Conjuring 2, those scared me. Um, their inside still scares me in moments, and I may help make it, but there are bits in that movie that are, that are scary. And there are other movies. I'm looking around just because I, I have a lot of my movies here, but like, uh, yeah, those are the ones that really are jumping out at me right now that are, are ones that, Definitely scared. Insidious movies. Um, okay. Those are good. Dead Silence. Like a lot of James Wan. James Wan, though, is really good uh, horror guy. And, and John Carp, The Thing, definitely scares me yeah. as its moments. Um, I'm excited. Uh, he has some projects going on right now. It sounds like he might actually make another movie. And I would be very excited. Because I have all of his vinyls like from... Um, of his music and stuff. And he, when he cares about a project, he's so good. Yeah. There are some projects there that you see that like, you can take, you know, Ghost of Mars isn't necessarily the greatest movie ever made, but he admits he was sort of burned out on filmmaking at that point. Mm -hmm. He was making a movie because he had the ability to make a movie. Whereas I think now he's passionately doing what he wants, making mu music for Halloween, the reboots. He's, you know, composing stuff and, and producing those. He's um, making comic books and video game consulting and stuff like that. It's it's really cool, you know, to see somebody who finding different passions. I was lucky enough to be able to see hit one of his live concert tour shows. He went on tour um, and he came out dressed in black and like with his hair all sleep back and everything and he just looked and acted like a rock star. And at one point he even said at one point, he's like, I didn't think at my age I'd be, a, I'd be able to come out here, but I feel like a rock star and everyone applauded and stuff. Cause it's pretty cool to like watch him like doing his music and like he gets into it so much. And like, you can tell how much he, ex how excited he is about like a tour, a music tour, mm -hmm. like at 70 something years old, you're, you're launching a music career like you've always done it, but it was done out of necessity. But now, like as he put it, you remove all of the all of the quote unquote problems with scoring. It was the movie he always joked because the movie held it held, holds you back in a lot of ways for music. Okay, because you have to score to hit beats, mm -hmm. which randomly is another thing. I'll turn. Um, I love the music in my documentary too. <laughs> I, I I love that whole that. Like I said. I'm just really because going to get that. Well, I mean, I guess we can discuss it after, but I'm definitely going to get it. Both of those movies, 
get them sent to you to get signed and then yeah uh yeah because especially this one i had uh we had a composer who, d- who writes music for blue bloods and and x files and all that the reboot like come on board and do a completely original score and then twisted uh wrote the original song for kane his theme song there that's over the end credits more than a monster and like yeah but no 100 percent. we need to make that happen um We'll talk after this too. Definitely, definitely. But um, so how did you get to meet Kane and like get him into your documentary? Yeah, so I read his book, um, and then immediately read it again because I wanted to make sure that I had read it correctly. Like Kane always jokes to me, and always every time I'm with him at a convention or whatever, he's always like, "How many times have you read my book to people online?" Because this guy's read it like how many times now? Ten. It's <laughs> I think about eight or nine, but I've read it a lot Mm -hmm. because during the process of making the film, I had to read it a bunch of times to like break down and write questions. Cause like people think there's no script in a doc and that's sort of true, but there is an entire, like I wrote questions for everybody Mm -hmm. somewhere. I have like a, a, a folder stacked full of like printed questions on my iPad. Still there's like file after file of, of note documents of like questions with the name of the person, like Sid Haig. And then all the questions I wanted to ask him and, and asked him and stuff. And it's like, I hold on to those because I think they're really cool to be able to see the start of what ended up happening. Like originally I would print everything out. And then as the movie went on, I went more and more digital and just had them on my iPad because then if they were talking and I thought of a question, instead of scribbling it on the paper, I could just type it, quickly yep. type it in there, and then um, it would be easier for me to read than trying to read my own yeah. very scribbled writing. And I'm not a, a very good writer as far as like <laughs> I'm very <laughs> messy I'm, with my writing. I'm saying, like I'll write something down. Like what the hell does this even say? <laughs> so no, I read it, and then I my uh, best friend is an entertainment attorney. Uh, so I said to him, "Man, you got to read this," and he read it. And I think he says he reread it again immediately too uh, because it was just that. And it's not an easy read. Mm -hmm. So when people say, you know, when I say I reread it immediately, like there were many moments while reading it, I had to stop and go watch an episode of Family Guy or American Dad or something and then go back and with a fresh, less emotional perspective, continue to read because he's been through some stuff and it's oh, yeah. comes across in the documentary comes across in the book too. I think they're great companion pieces for one another. I, um, a lot of people say the documentary is based on the book. I wouldn't necessarily say that certainly inspired by it. I think they're both. Yeah. One of them is visual. One of them is, is written or audio depending on how you, how you experience it. But it still is like, I would never tell anyone not to read unmasked i think it's a great book and i don't think anyone who reads who i don't think mike aloisi i know mike aloisi wouldn't ever tell anyone not to see the doc because he was a part of it and he also very much appreciates what we did because we did not try to take thunder from the book we just wanted to make the visual component of it be able to have kane tell these stories in person to you for the first time. Of what? course, the book's the first time he told them, but in, in per, you know, via it, seeing his face, yeah. uh, exactly, uh, was in the doc. Which was cool, though. I mean, I read, I read the book. Well, I did, I did the audiobook version because I was listening to it at work. And the cool thing about, the, which I do need to buy the hardcover of that book, but the cool thing about the audiobook is it's Kane reading the story. Yeah. So then it puts even more emotion into it. So you get that, and then you watch the documentary, which, I mean, Kane's obviously in the documentary, so you get to hear him and see him. And it's just like, he's really been through so, so much, and yet he's still one of the, as far as celebrities go, he's one of the nicest people I've ever met. And No, he is. I, I see how he interacts with fans just on, like, YouTube clips, the documentary, you know, just certain things, the book. Like, he, in his book, he's shouting out a bunch of fans. Agreed, no, and... And yeah, so when, when I read it and then Andrew read it, because Andrew Barcel is my entertainment attorney friend, I, uh, him and I partnered up at that point and founded the company, Master of Macabre Entertainment, that I have. Um, and 
uh, he came on as a producer, but he reached out because he's an entertainment attorney. He represents the mo- he represented the movie and reached out mm-hmm. and uh, to Kane's manager, and then we started getting in contact. And it took like a couple conversations with her, and then we set up a meeting with Kane. And at the meeting, we just clicked. And uh, so Kane was pretty much like, "If you can start shooting by this date," and he gave a date. Um, I'm in. And at the time, Kane didn't know this then, but I've said it since. At the time, we had people interested in funding it, but we had didn't have money like in the bank account necessarily. Uh, we were like, great, and we signed documents, but we didn't necessarily know 100% we were going to get it. But at that point, we knew we had to. Like mm-hmm. we knew, and a lot of the documentary happened that way. Is like we knew. Whenever there was an example of a time we needed money, it became a big need for money. It would be like, we need a lot of money now. <laughs> it's like, and we were lucky enough every time through some source or another, uh, be it a, a friend or a, a parent or a, a, a lot, most of it was private investors. We, would, we, we found somebody who was just as eager to get the story told. That's Especially crazy. once, you know, the hardest part is getting that first bit of money. And I really have to say that um, one of the, the Russ and Sherry Forga, who are some of our co-producers on it, uh, like uh, with their company, um, 4J's Productions, they uh, were a big source of that. And they were that, you know, sort of uh, mm-hmm. from the very beginning believed in, in me and Andrew and what we could do. And, and Russ and I, it's funny, we worked uh, in film school. He was one of the actors in a project I did. Uh, and I reached out to him just because I was sort of reaching out to everybody. And you never know. And that's why I say to people, you never know who the people who are going to help you the most are sometimes. Like, you never know. You know, they, they just love movie making. And they want to do, and they also produce their inside. Like Andrew and I produced it, but they also came on board as investors and producers on that too, because they believe in in us and they and they believed in the project. That's awesome. And talent back was was is in some ways easier to get people, I think, to jump on than a narrative sometimes, because it's like uh, if you see if I sent a couple like video interviews of Kane to them and then the copy of the book, and they immediately like knew he could talk eloquently and he had a story to tell. So it's a little bit easier to like, be like, if we can get this told well, you know, and I think Kane in some ways was a little bit, he says he wasn't, but I was a new filmmaker at the time. I'm sure he had his moments of doubt. Mm -hmm. However, he said, um, he didn't, but you know, we made sure that first day, first two days of filming uh, that we had like, we were on a, a soundstage. That's a lot of the footage of the film. When it's Kane, um, we built, like, had an actual set built and Kane's on it. It's like a dilapidated house set. Mm. And that is a lot of what we, and that was the first two days of filming was 10 hour days with Kane sitting in a chair talking for 10 hours. Mm. So, you know, we, we had a lot of fun despite the fact that it was some serious subject matter. Because when the camera stopped rolling and Kane, you know, would get out of the zone of having to tell a sad story, we would he would joke around. We had delicious, crafty food, you know, catering. We made sure it was a professional environment, and that way, I think it led us to be able to have a more, uh, prof- you know, professional and working relationship m- moving on. Especially as we had to get more run and gun with it with some of the other shoots. Mm-hmm. which were a little less we we always knew that he always knew that that is that was like our standard was what we had done those first couple of days mm-hmm. and we kept that up throughout the throughout the film it just you know it was always an interesting ride when it came to the to the filmmaking process but that's how we started met with Kane got the film going and and honestly, didn't look back for a long time. That pro- it took a long time to film this movie, but I'm very proud of what we were able to do. 
Oh, you you definitely should be because again, as a huge horror fan and a, a Kane Hodder fan, I was just like, wow. And I remember when I first heard about it coming out, I was like, when this comes out, I got to get it. I got to watch it. And then I remember it was, it was released on Amazon Prime. And I was talking to my wife, I was like, you want to watch the documentary with me about Kane Hodder? She's like, yeah, sure. And we watched it one night and just just both amazed on how well the story, and I knew the story somewhat because again, I heard the book and I was telling her certain things I was like, that were coming up like with him. Um, when he was playing Jason, like when he's in the full, full costume, how he would pee in somebody's trailer that had me in tears. I was telling, I was like, I remember reading this in the book, just things like that. Yeah. We had, and we had a lot of interview about that, but certain thing, it was like, how does peeing in a, dressing room relate to Kane's personal life. Not really. Uh, it's funny. Yes. So that's why we kept certain stories in about his prankster. Other ones we have on the disc. And other ones um, I might release at some point. Like, I have no problem releasing additional footage. Like, I did a, I have a, on our YouTube channel for Master Macabre, I released, uh, I got a Kane Hodder tattoo um, of his face on my, let me see. It should be easy enough to... Like Kane's face is right here on oh. my chest with a signature underneath it. And we recorded Kane seeing it for the first time. And what's funny is it was his tattoo artist who did a signature and his tattoo artist portrait guy at the same studio as him who did the portrait. So like I went into New Hampshire when I was filming in Massachusetts at a rock and shock convention when we got Twisted's interview. Uh, we were up there and I took the opportunity to go to Salem, New Hampshire, this Shogun tattoo and have them do the portrait for me. And they were in the documentary as well. And it is uh, a great likeness of him, but like he had never seen it before. So we filmed it and it obviously didn't fit anywhere in the movie. And at the time we were releasing the documentary, you know, working full time, I was able to put together 90 minutes of stuff but like a lot of his other supplementary stuff, um, I just didn't get a chance to get around to. So I have various moments like that, that eventually I definitely want to put together and like either release it digitally or in an ideal world, I would love to do a, a special edition uh, Blu-ray at some point where I was able to, where I'm able to put even more material on it. Uh, originally I wanted to do like a director's cut of the doc, but this film, I was assistant director on it. I'm very proud of it. This is a director's cut. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> so anything additional will be just bonus scenes. And that's why we have 90 minutes of stuff already on there, but I could probably do at least another 90 of new material, especially like Kane and I have been talking like maybe about doing revisiting 10 years after the doc, um, which would be 2025. Cause we filmed in 2015. Um, doing like a 10 year mini doc. That would be awesome. That's just something that him and I, we haven't, you know, officially said anything, but at the end of it, Adam Green says in 10 years, you could do a whole nother documentary. And Kane and I are like, we'll see what happens. Cause so much has happened with him since already mm -hmm. uh, between obviously Victor Crowley, um, which was happening at the tail end of this. Cause we premiered uh, at Fright Fest and uh, two days before Fright Fest, started they did the 10th anniversary screening of hatchet which ended up being the new movie mm -hmm. and in hollywood and we were supposed to go to that and we flew out to london uh because of of that because kane's like eh, it's you know 10th anniversary thing you don't need to go necessarily and then he found out and we tried to fix our tickets and it was going to cost so much money that we just figured we'll see the movie uh, two, three days later here in, in London and we were able to see it on the big screen and with Kane and Adam. And it was, it's a great movie. I, I'd love to, Adam and I have been talking too about doing a pro, another project, to, like a project together. And I would love to do that. Like that's one of the biggest things for me that's come of it is the, um, is meeting these colleagues and, and friends like Felissa Rose and I talk all the time. Um, I'd love to work with her again and Kane and anybody who was in this. I really wanted to work with Sid Haig again, but yeah. I was very proud 
that I was able to work with him in this capacity. At least I was able to meet him. Mm -hmm. At least we were able to make him laugh. Mm -hmm. At least I was able to see, because he says it in the film, but the passion he had for for meeting fans and the the fact he knew um, what a gift he had and being able to help and talk to people. And, And I saw him convention after convention going and donning that clown costume, even though he didn't necessarily want to do it all the time. You know, he was getting older and he didn't necessarily want to get put into all that every time, but you wouldn't, he would never let anyone, even me see that. You just tell sometimes it was like more of, I I don't know if it was more of he didn't want to do it or more of a, I think it was more, he didn't want to let down those people in his line. Cause like Kane, he always had this big line. I don't think he wanted to tell them, hold on. I got to go spend 45 minutes getting put into a clown costume. Yep. And then spend two hours doing photos. I think he'd rather have spent the time interacting with them. And you know, I never got anything signed by. Well, I guess I have his release. <laughs> I was going to say I don't think I have anything signed by some of these guys, but they all signed releases to be in the doc. But like certain people, like Kane, I have like all this autograph stuff of. But um, other people, I don't really have a lot of stuff from because I thought it was weird to like have somebody I worked with like Adam Green I I dropped off a bunch of signed stuff for his uh Yorkathon uh, benefit and we talked for a while and like I'd love for him to sign things I think I have a sign digging up the marrow from before I worked with him but like mm-hmm. I think it's weird to like bring a hatchet documentary to a mo- you know blu-ray and have him sign it in some ways <laughs> um as much as I think he's a brilliant filmmaker and I I definitely look up to him I am just proud that we're now colleagues and not just fan. I'm not just yeah. a fan as much anymore. And like, I, I never met him. I told him this just like Kane. I didn't meet either of them before this project because I didn't want to just be that guy. And yeah. that's why I don't really go to conventions as a fan that much anymore. Not because I don't like them, but because once you go as a filmmaker, it kind of, tarnishes it a teeny bit and not from any perspective of the of uh the fans or the community it's just um i like going as a guest of canes or felicis or somebody like that because i prefer meeting people through people i know Mm -hmm. and less through like waiting in line for an hour and a half to meet somebody it's never fun i mean it is i'll take it back it is fun if you're with a group a lot of times I go to these things, it's just me. So to stand in line <clears throat> for an hour and a half to meet someone when I can just walk to Kane and say, uh, I've never met uh, Danny Trejo, Kane. Um, do you know him? And Kane's like, oh, yeah, we work together on this movie. And then walks, you know, if he has a lull in crowd or if he needs to grab a bite to eat, we'll just casually walk over to Danny Trejo's table and – and that really happened, and, and he'd introduce, he introduced me. This is the guy that made my documentary. Oh, nice to meet you. And then, like, it kind of opens up the what? abilities there instead of having to... And I don't have anything against it waiting in line or anything, but I definitely have a respect for the fans who are able to happily go and, and spend this time because that shows their passion and dedication. And, and we had it at some of the signings for the doc, like, we did one of Dark Delicacies, and it was like an hour line in there for for Kane and myself to sign the the Blu-ray and, and posters and stuff. And um, for people to wait that long, it, it always makes me it very humbled and proud to be able to do what I'm lucky enough to do. See, now that that right there is awesome too, though, man. And I I look at it like as far as I was saying how you'd rather go as like a guest with Kane or, you know, be a guest with Kane or Felissa Rose. I think it's awesome. And I think it's smart and a great advantage for you in a sense of you get to meet these other actors and that, and it's their like co-sign like, Hey, this is a good, this is a really good guy. He did this. You know, I worked on him with this, which it's smart and it's awesome. And then like, I think as a horror fan myself, it's kind of, it's inspiring in a sense of you started out as a fan of these people. And then you go from that to being, friends with some of them which i think is awesome and it, it it inspires me being a podcaster just you know 
branching out more and getting more people like yourself on and other people on to where I can just, even if I don't become friends with them, so to speak, just to sit down with them and just have a, a nice fun conversation. That right you, there Yeah. Really have you done one with Felicia yet? I want to so bad. I have not. And the funny thing is I met her so many times and this, like this year is my second year doing this podcast this past January, but I met her this past, I've seen her again this past October at a con and me and my brother were so busy. We had to do a bunch of panels. So we couldn't really, I had a table and stuff there. I was, we were barely at the table me, between me and my brother and my wife, but me and my brother were ones doing the panels because we have the media pass. And then like I, with the media pass, they want you to do the, which I'm fine doing panels. I'm like, it's cool. And like all the panels I was on was um, like one with podcasting one-on-one, you know, stuff like that. One was with special, one, the funny thing is they had us on a special effects panel, right? And I was up there by myself talking. There was supposed to be like a, a guest speaker in there that was, that knew I was just supposed to moderate it, that knew about special effects. So I'm up there talking, my brother, my wife walk in, my brother's like, I'm going to, I'm going to let him sit up there and sweat for a minute. He's up there. So he's eating something. So he comes in there. We're talking for a few minutes and then we're like, you know what? I think my wife went left cause she was like walking around, went to the table or something cause she was eating. I forgot. But um, <clears throat> we were talking and there was people actually in there that knew about special effects. Like lucky enough, there was a couple people in there that actually do, you know, the makeup, just, cosplays and do all that kind of stuff and then those people who did like haunted houses there was four people and they just said something and we're like hey does anybody here know about this stuff hey why don't you four come up here and we gave them the panel because we knew nothing about i'm like we knew nothing about it. like all, all i could say is special effects are cool i like special effects in such and such a movie that's how it started but it was cool the cool thing about that was and i'm glad it happened the way it did was because we gave other people an opportunity to not only let their voices be heard but let them sit up at the panel and once it was all over, they thanked. They're like, "Thank you guys so much for." I was like, "No, no, do not thank you for going up there because that was about to be a shit show up there." Be you know what I mean? Like you go up there talking, you don't know what you're talking about. But it was. It, I like being on panels because, for one, like I was on the panel for um, another panel. I was on Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven. Oh yeah. I wish Kane Harder was there for that one. That would I would have been real nervous if he was, but it was still really cool. And. You, I mean, being on those panels, the ones that you are on with the celebrities, you get to talk to celebrities, which is always great, before, during, and after the panel, of course. And the other panels that you're on, it's also a good way to promote yourself. And it's, you know, it's like, hey, like what I've been doing, what I would do when I go on a panel is, especially if I'm there, say if I'm, me and my brother are on there, I'll have a stack of business cards. And while he's talking or while I'm talking, one of us will just go through the whole crowd and just hand them out. And, yeah, no, that's what with me is that's why I always use my full name when I, when I do film or, or anything really, mm -hmm. it's always Derek Dennis Herbert because I want to like link everything together. So like with, yes. with magic, with um, filmmaking, with, uh, with anything really, I always use all of them and people have always given me crap for it or recently they haven't really been, but like, let's be so much slow, so much a little less text. If you just do Derek Herbert and it's like, no, but like Derek but, Dennis Herbert is, is like the name. It's like a, it's your brand. It's exactly. And like with me, the horror research sturdy, like it's all across the board. And that's what pe people know me by sir sturdy. Like when I go to some of these cons, which is, I love it. But, and, like, and it's like, when I say I'm the only Derek Dennis Herbert on Facebook, it's true. If you search my full name, I'm the only one. See, and that's it's, and I mean, that that you're the only one. I mean, just saying that, like, you're using that on all your platforms just so people can, f like, hey, this is Derek Dennis Herb. I know how to find this guy. Yeah. And even if it's my other one, like Derek D. Herbert on Twitter and Instagram and stuff, it's still close enough where yes. it's easy to find. And when you go into it, you'll see my full name there. It's just, and the images, like, usually, typically I keep my profile images the same. If I update one, I update all of them. So if you're ever looking for me, it's always the same picture because I want to make sure people know that like it's the real you. It's the real me. And you know, right now I'm not so I'm not really thinking there are duplicates, but uh, I I just think from a long term perspective of marketing and branding myself is that it's better to to go with that approach. And yeah, no, I definitely feel like you know I agree with you completely though that like that that's a good way to kind of continue to grow your uh, podcast as well as, you know, you, as you meet people, they know people, they promote to their people. And like, 
And then you, you know, people like for me, you and I were talking a while ago about being on and then because of craziness of life, it wasn't, it, I, it didn't end up happening at the time, but then because of the craziness of life again, like craziness of life again, it was able to happen very quickly this time. Like we started, you know, when I posted that two minute short and posted about the doc being on shutter, we started talking again and that was like a couple days ago and we were able to make it happen so fast. And I think that's why it's smart that you're doing, you've done so many and you continue to do them because like people like Felissa and stuff. Yeah. Of course she's home with her husband and kids, but she can't, they're not making anything right now necessarily. So why not do podcasts and promote yourself and promote the fact that you're doing these projects later on? I would love to get her on here. Like that's, and going back to that, I, like I was going to get some people from the terrifier cast on here and from, and Felissa Rose, but we were just that whole weekend. We were just busy, like literally busy. We were at our table for like the few, we'd get a few minutes at the table here and there. And then it's like, okay, we got another panel. And a lot of the panels were back to back. And now you could do get Felissa Rose and the people from terrifier on the same podcast uh, because you heard she's going to be in terrifier too. I actually have something to say about that. Funny thing, because I'll send you the YouTube link too. My brother did a panel with, I let him, I, cause it was his, he's never done a panel before, right? He flew out from Colorado. So I, you know, we had like the way the panels are set up, they ask you, cause there was only three podcasts there and like 20 panels. So we had to cover all of those between the three of us, which was fine. So what I did was like for the Terrifier one and for the Sleepaway Camp one, cause they only wanted one moderator up there. I told my brother he can take those too. Because there was other panels. I know there, there was like a podcasting one-on-one panel and like something similar to that that I knew he wouldn't really have much to say about. But those two, move, you know, those two things, he would, he'd be, he would kill it. I knew he would knock it out the park. So I was like, you could do those two and I'll do these. He's like, like, of course. You remember? Yes, you got it. And that's when that Friday night, we're at that con. We're at the VIP party. Felissa Rose and the Terrifier cast actually announced it to us that she was going to be in it. And then they announced it live at that panel that he was hosting, which was just so free. That was just so cool that he got to like, I missed the terrifier panel cause I was doing a panel and then my other panel ended right in time for me to see the sleepaway camp. one, so I got to see that whole thing, but it was, it was cool seeing him up there. And like, again, he's so he's just as passionate about horror as I am. And he was, he thanked me so many times for it. And it's just like, I didn't do it for, I just did. Cause I'm like, I know you'll enjoy it. I know you'll do good up there. And, I, no, I agree. A great time. No, and I think that I'm just so excited to see, you know, with Kane, with Lissa, with so many of these people, I, I'm always excited to see their careers keep growing because you wouldn't think somebody who's Kane's age, and he's by no means because he'll get, he'll, he'd get mad at me if I said it, and I would never say it. He's not old uh, by any means because you're as old as you feel, and Kane does not. Like he's not old by yeah. any means, but you know, you want to think somebody who's already by what I mean by what I'm about to say is you want to think somebody who's had such a successful career in horror and in stunts would be able to reinvent themselves a third time. Mm-hmm. That's really my point, and he is, oh. and it's fascinating to see. And I know as I'm I'm prepping a script right now um, that I'm one of the writers on it. And a feature, and like one of the main things I'm thinking is like, it's not a horror, it's nowhere near a horror, it's like a fantasy family film. And I'm thinking is one of the lead characters of Kane. And because I know that Kane can do other stuff, and whenever he give, is given an opportunity to do something, he knocks it out of the park. Mm-hmm. But he just, um, and same with Felissa, like, she's a, a crazy talented actress. Like, Victor Crowley, I loved her character. I, uh, I'm very excited to see what she does in, in Terrifier 2. I w- it would be ecstatic if they did something else with Sleepaway Camp. Because mm-hmm. Return to Sleepaway Camp was a fun little fun movie as well. Mm-hmm. The first one was obviously the, the best, but then that like sequel that they made years later, the only official sequel that the original director came back, Robert, to do. But like I would love if if Felissa came back to do something else with, with Angela. But I, I also think in some ways it's, it's in a strange way, and it's a good thing to be above her in some ways too. I think she's going to be too big for it when it comes out. Okay. Not saying she won't do it, 
because I think she'll always be eager to do it. But I think I wouldn't be shocked if she, both her and Kane had roles in major films again, mm. especially with the revolving landscape of things. I think, I don't think there's a reason why somebody like Kane couldn't win an Oscar in his lifetime. And I think that boggles people's minds when they think the guy that played Jason, the guy that did all this stuff, but like he is a great actor. Like he, and he doesn't even consider himself an actor, but he's still <laughs> like, that's the funny part. Like he, but he's that good. Like he's, and I think a lot of it is that he just, he has a natural gift for it. Yeah, I he's agree. born with a natural gift for it. And then he's learned by watching actors and from being in these movies all these years. I agree. He's, he's again, great great guy and those two are like my um those two are my dreams to get on this podcast one day i had you know who i did get on here though which was awesome was um because i can't think of his name now kincaid i can't think of his real name i know it too it's at the tip of my tongue from nightmare on elm street part three. Oh, cool yeah okay i know who you're talking about it'll, it'll, it's gonna come to me so late but anyway i was at same kind of something about before i was at scaricon and me and him, Ken Sagos. There yes. Was. Me and him were joking around. Like, I met him that Friday, and my brother had sent me money to get his autograph for him. I was like, okay, no, you know, and, and other autographs. So he sent me money to get his autograph, and I was talking to my wife. And I'm like, you know, I was asking, I was like, what do you want? He's like, you just give me an 8 by 10 But they had, a, they had the script there from, so I got that. We got that for him signed. And with that, he gave us like an 8 by 10 and a couple other things that he threw in there for him. And the first thing he did, which was awesome, was my wife was like, hey, she was like, my brother-in-law, he, you know, he, had, he moved out to Colorado, so he wasn't able to be here. Is there any way you can call him on his break, on his, I think it was lunch break or 15-minute break or whatever? He's like, yeah, of course. He's like, when he's on break, just come over here and let me know. So I, and the, the cool thing was, I didn't even tell my brother. It was like, it was 100% surprise. I didn't call him and give him a heads up. I just <laughs> went over to, you know, Ken Sagos, called him on my phone and handed him the phone. Just let me know what my brother's name was. They talked to him for like 10, 15 minutes, which was just amazing. And after that, my brother was thanking us so much and he was just so happy about it. I was like, yo, I was like, honestly, I can't take the credit. That was all Francis, which is my wife. And that was all her idea. And later on, I was talking to Ken again. Like it, it came to the point where I would go back. I'll just be walking around, you know, getting autograph. After I'm done getting my autographs, just walking around just to walk around. Hey, Aaron, come over here. Come hang out with me for a little while. Okay, no problem. So I'll go hang out. Me and him are back and forth, joking back and forth, making people laugh as he's signing autographs and all this. And my wife was like, you should ask him, you know, when I walked with her, she was like, you should ask him to get on your podcast. I was like, that's a good idea. I was like, I'm going to go ask him right now. So I told him, you know, I asked him about it. And I was like, I'd love to get you on my podcast one day, not thinking it would be this weekend. And he was like, I explained to him what it was. And he was like, oh, of course, I would love to. He was like, give me about a half hour and come back and remind me. And I'll come over, and I'll come over there, which meant so much to me because in that time, you know, I came back, got him came over there, sat with me for about 20 minutes to a half hour. And in that time of recording that conversation and all that good stuff, that's time he's taken out to sign autographs and put money in his pocket. And also, you know, a lot of his money, he sends it to, he has like a bunch of fund foundations and stuff, which is awesome. Yeah. So he took the time to do that, which meant the world to me. Cause I'm like, you didn't, he really did not have to do that. And I, no, well, now that, that with with the documentary, a lot of the people did that too. They would they would take the time like out of doing convention. Like Kane didn't really have to for for much of it because of the way we were able we shot it. But like um, Robert England took uh, he was supposed to take a half hour, end up taking an hour. I, I uh, got done with the interview, looked at my phone, and had like ten missed calls from his uh, manager of him. Like, where is he? Um, because yeah, obviously my phone is on silent for the whole oh, yeah, film, yeah. just like it is right now. Same here. But like, um, when it when it comes to, um, yeah, it's it just, but that's how much they wanted to talk about Kane is that they were willing to, you know, they would, and that's what we found. Like a lot of the people, you know, one of the questions I get asked is like, how did you get these people? And it's like, Kane in a lot of ways got them. Like some of them, literally, he reached out to and said, hey making a documentary do you want to do it if so do you want me to set this up do you want me to give them your information how do we want to do this mm -hmm. but a bunch of them we also just would reach out to Felissa was a complete surprise 
she was at the convention. We saw their rapport back and forth. And she was sitting near him in Indianapolis at this convention, Days of the Dead we were at. And I was like, why don't we get an interview with her? Like we knew Bill Mosley and Sid Haig were going to be there, but Felissa was a complete surprise get. And she is one of the funniest parts of, and most touching. She has some of the, some amazing moments in the documentary because she cares that much. At a time where her and Kane were close, but not that close. Mm -hmm. Since then though, they become much closer because, and she always says he's like a brother to her. And in a lot of ways, like he's helped her, I think elevate her convention game and, and the two of them have both, you know, been able to collaborate now on Victor Crowley and Death House and uh, going to, you know, hopefully do it many more times. Like, they love working together and they're a hoot at these conventions. Like, their rapport back and forth is, is some of the funniest things you'll ever see. If you haven't seen it yet, you'll laugh when you... <laughs> When I, I I can't wait to see that because I I've met her so many times and each time it's just so she's so nice she's such a sweet person and that's the funny part is like the two of them have this rapport that's hilarious and you know but I know all the different sides of Kane at this point though because of the doc like I was I've been lucky enough to be able to you know I'm one of the few people who who was able to interview you know his wife and kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, they never do any kind of pub public thing because, like, they're not public people. He is. Yep. But he was willing to open up his family to us because, obviously, they're important to his story. He's immensely proud of his sons and, and wife, and she's had an extremely successful career of her own. And they're just, like, every normal family. Like, Mike Aloisi says, like, they, like, sit and watch TV and laugh about how how old some of his movies are and, like, Mm -hmm. It's just, it cracks me up because it, 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 that is their dynamic. It isn't being, we're not lying in the documentary or, or stretching the truth, but Kane's just their dad. It's not like, there's no like, I, I mean, they know what he does, and, yeah. but like, it's, it's, it's different. You go to the conventions and it's like, Kane, Kane, Kane goes home and, you know, deals with being a hands-on parent. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I really loved about this documentary. And what I love about certain documentaries in general is when you're watching, when you're watching these things, especially like with Helen back and you see, you know, you're interviewing his family and the kids are always the funniest because it's like, yeah, that's just dead. <laughs> like, and, I, and, and the funny thing about it, is that's just like a normal parent father. Too. Like, yeah, that's, that's just dead. Like, yeah, he I remember my dad has had this uh, very eventful career. Like, Doing, he's been successful doing a lot of crazy things, but for the life of me, I never knew any of his job titles until I was old enough. Like, businessman is what I told the teacher. Like, like my dad never had that. I mean, technically, I guess he works in business, but like, you know, when you're like the you know supervisor of all this or the manager of this or whatever, the last thing you want to be referred to is uh, you senior vice president. All of a sudden. He's a businessman. End of list. End of detail. That's all I knew. And it, it cracks me up because it's like in some way, you know, people like in the horror industry too, it's like, what does your dad do? He he makes movies. It's like I'm sure it's like what like John Carpenter's son would have said for years. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, he's made some movies. It's like he's made some of the most influential films in the history of horror. Yep. What do you mean he makes movies? And it, it cracks me up, but it's it's true. Kids, you know, it's dad, it's the guy who raised us, it's not necessarily anything more than that. I think later on in life, a lot of times, the scope of it becomes more aware. Yeah, oh yeah. I was just watching this documentary on Netflix, Circus of Books, and I think that one is the same kind of logic. Is like the kids knew their parents like operated a bookstore and were influential in the gay community, but they didn't know that they operated like the bookstore and like what yeah. ultimately their parents did and all the things until like the other parents kind of not hit it from the mess hit it, but like um, they had their home life and they had their business life. And it's the same way here as Kane goes to conventions and does all this and they know where he is and what he's doing. And then he comes home and like, are you going to dwell on that all the time? Or are you going to have a life? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to have your life. And I mean, it's, it's just so awesome because it, it makes you feel more connected with them. You yes, know, I agree. Like, we might look up to these people as, like, 
I guess for Kane, it would be like a horror superhero in a sense. And then their kids, again, which is, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing bad about it. Oh, hey, that's just my dad. That's just dad. That's my dad. That's, you know, he's in movies. <laughs> like, no. Do you know who that is? Like, yes, yeah, my dad. No. Do you know what your father did? Yes, I know. I have every movie that my father was in. Calm down. Relax. No, this guy's awesome. I need his autograph. But he's, <clears throat> I just love it, man. And I, again, back to this documentary, I think you guys did such an amazing, amazing job with it. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I, I'm proud of it. I, I'm glad that we're having the reactions we are because so many, I've heard, Kane's heard from a lot of people and I've heard messages from people who it's helped um, marriages or, or open up communication between parents and kids or mm -hmm. all these kind of things about like you have gone through more traumatic experiences and I just saw a good story. I'm just, and I'm very happy that other people, it, it means even more to like it had that impact and it was able, people were able to see it for something greater than just a, uh, cause I originally set out to make just a fun documentary and it ended up being so much more powerful. And, and, and that is thanks to Kane's story and, and then the ability to modify like the original story for this film and what ultimately made is very different. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't, I, I, I don't think the original story would have been quite as compelling, but we let Kane's storytelling uh, and, and interviews shape the story. And even though we have interviews on everything, the things, the major focal points yeah. really, really structured it. And, the, and we purposely like switched up orders and moved things around because we always wanted, we always had like a 10 minute rule in mind. Like every 10 minutes, we wanted to make sure we hit on horror and human interest. So we wouldn't lose any of the audience members because we, we're thinking if we have two different groups watching this, we can't have too much horror or too much human interest in, in any 10 minute block. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to try to make sure that there's enough that grabs both, both different groups. And I think by thinking like that, we were able to make something even more compelling because it is it's a roller coaster ride of emotion you know it, it takes you up here and then down and then back all of a sudden his career is going great and then yeah the, and then the bullying and then his career is going great and then the burn and then he builds himself back up and becomes jason and everything's going great and then he loses the role and that it kind of just back up and down and then I think that, and I think we end on an up, and that's what I always wanted. It was to end on, with that montage, making sure people knew that uh, life, and this was important to Kane too, is that like, uh, despite the hardships he's faced and other people face in their lives, because we all experience them, we're all experiencing a mass one together right now. Yes. Um, things do improve, and there's always ways to make your life better. Like, you know, that there are many points in his story where uh, ending his life wouldn't have been looked, I don't think anyone would have looked down on him for considering the option mm -hmm. or at least it entering his thoughts. But he would have missed so many things in his life and that was crucial to him. Like he said that line and and, and originally we, we, we all, I think we always ended with him saying, look what I would have missed. But I'm very proud that we ended with that because I think it really helps illustrate sort of everything. And yeah. one of his biggest, the, I think the only big note he had was he wanted his family in the end montage. Because originally we ended with a career montage. And he said, I would have missed my family too. And they're a huge part of my life. And I don't think that even entered my head for a bit. Mm -hmm. So I re we recut together the montage, adding in newspaper or like newspaper articles and magazines and photos of his family, and it hits so much bigger, like the emotions because it your life isn't just your career. That's only a part of it. Your family is a huge aspect for any of us of your life and family and friends and and hobbies and everything. It's not just. Um, your career it's 
you know, people are a lot more than the job they do. Oh yeah. A job, <clears throat> honestly, the job, no matter what it is, and this is no disrespect to anybody that does a job, but I feel like that's like the least important thing in life versus the people who you care about, the people who you truly care about, the people who truly care about you. That's what life is really about. And then everything that's else. Why you, that's why you work. That's why you do the things. Even if you're in film, even if you're doing conventions, even if you're a magician, you work for your family. Mm-hmm. And you work to be able to spend time not working. <laughs> it's a very funny. The world is very funny in that regard. And and the, that's the reason why, you know, a lot of a, you know, a lot of people's goal is to work as little as possible. Um like in an ideal world, I think all of us would make, you know, be Steven Spielberg and make one movie every 2 years. Um because that me I mean, he he produces a lot more than that, but I mean the idea of being able to take time. Mhm to not work is also a very uh, interesting thing. And, and it's one that I am hoping to be able to achieve sooner than later, because I would like to get to the point where, cause I don't consider filmmaking magic, any of that stuff work necessarily because it is my passion as well. So I would much prefer, I, that's why I'm working very hard to transition. This current, this Corona has taught me one thing, which is, I want to transition away from day jobs as soon as I can. Mm -hmm. Like not that I have any problem with my day job. I love where I work, but I think life is short and you need to, I'd rather spend it doing exactly what I was put here to do. And that's uh, entertain people through multiple platforms, but entertain people. See, and I'm with you 1 million percent on that. As far as like my podcast platform, my YouTube thing that I do, I really, really have a passion for it, and I really love doing it. And I feel each time I do it, I get a little bit better. I feel each time, every second that I spend on it, I get a little bit better. Like I said, I've been doing this, as far as the podcasting goes, for two years. And from day one to day, whatever this is now, I know I've gotten so much better. And not that I don't like my job and don't appreciate my job, because I do. And it's just not a passion. You know, this is like a passion. I would love to be able to do it. I would love for this to be my nine to five, so to speak, just because I, I really enjoy doing it. But I know there's a lot more to it to just, you can't just, okay, I'm done. I tell my wife, like, yeah, you know what? I quit, I quit the state job. I'm just going to podcast. Like I, I can't. No, not, I mean, you have but to make sure. You have to make there's sure. A point, I mean, listen, there's a point where uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get there. There's a point where that is a feasible thing, but it's, um, with a lot of this, it's like with podcast, it's like you need sponsors and you need yes. promotions and you need to line up uh, a lot of guests and, right. and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then once that point hits, I, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible. Everything's possible. Oh, definitely. It's just, and, and it's certainly something to, to work towards because um, you're very natural uh, at this, it seemed, or you've worked very hard on it, or both, one of the two, because this is the one of the most conversational type things I've ever done, uh, which is is great. Um, I like the fact that we're we're going through questions, we're going through content, but we're not like it's not just question, 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 question. It's a, an organic process, and that I think makes you a bit unique as well. Is that uh, a lot of these, I feel like they have their 10 questions and then move on. And I think being able to have a conversation with somebody, be it me or be it somebody, you know, if all of a sudden uh, you got an email from Quentin Tarantino's people to be able to do the same level of uh, conversation is very different. And and uh, that's the important thing. And I think I don't think you would flinch at getting – some big, you know, Spielberg or Tarantino interview, you might freak out on your own, but I think by the time you came on to do it, you'd be just as collected as you are right now. I I greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. And like I was telling you in the beginning, I will watch, like if somebody sends me their, you know, getting you on, I've watched hell and back. I will watch people's projects, but I don't like looking up too much about, I'm not gonna say I don't look up any, I don't know any, I don't like looking up too much stuff about them, if anything at all, just because I want to, like you're saying, the conversation, I told you to be more organic versus me asking you silly questions. Not, I'm not going to say dumb questions. Cause I don't want to disrespect anybody, but, but you know, just asking you the same question, so to speak. 
And I mean, me and you've been talking for about two hours, and I think only about four. It seems like only about five questions have been asked, and it's just a <laughs> conversation, which is a great thing, though. I think that's the best way to. I think that's the best way interviews go, because I look at I look at this more of like just having seriously, just letting your hair down, like two friends having a beer if you drink, if not having a water, and just having a nice conversation about horror, so to speak. For just for no, I was considering having a drink during this podcast because it's Cinco de Mayo, but then I realized. On West Coast time, it's 10 a.m. and I was like, not, not even during quarantine. I'm not. I'm not. It's. Hey. I'm not going with five o'clock anywhere right now. In I that would, mentality, I wouldn't, I wouldn't judge you, man. I've drank on this podcast a couple times. Um, I've done it before on other other ones, but usually it's after. It's when they're evening ones. But like, um, yeah, it's 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 definitely an interesting thing. But no, I agree. It's it's very conversation, and I wouldn't say stupid either. Like, I don't think I've ever been ask a stupid question i've seen stupid questions on different channels be asked but i'm lucky enough where i think and not of people i've had interviews with but you yeah. you see these culmination things of celebrities like tarantino being asked questions about like women's representation that he's answered a million times and you know what their reaction is going to be why would you ask it that type like, of stuff wouldn't even cross my mind like for me it's more of again, trying to make a good conversation, but like what really, what drives you, what got you into this and what keeps you into this? And then just wherever the conversation goes from there, after I ask, you know, a couple of questions like I did for you in the beginning, then wherever the conversation goes, the conversation goes. Cause yeah. I feel like I, I'm asking, like I'm talking as a fan, but I'm also talking as like, I have to be professional about it. And I don't want it to sound like a job interview. Like that's how I feel some interviews are, where it's like, okay, well, where do you see yourself in this and this, that, and third, which isn't bad questions, but it's just like, I think they're um, not. I won't say stupid or bad. I'll say they're nervous questions. It's more like I'm so nervous, and it's like you just have to go in there. You, sometimes you get the butterflies. You just have to let all that go. Do whatever you have to do to relax yourself, and just go in there and just have a conversation. Because at the end of the day, we're all people. We're all normal people. Some people just agreed. The, the, I'll, I'll say the difference is people are more famous than others. People have a lot more money than others. Other than that, we're all people. We all bleed. You know all that good stuff, and just go in there. And try to enjoy yourself with it, and make it make it as entertaining as you can without trying to overdo it. Like don't, like the way you see me on my show. If you watch my other episodes, that's how my personality really is. There's times where I'm acting goofy because you know if you if you have one of your boys on, like if I have my brother on, where you have wild conversations about horror and just whatever in general. But that's how we are when we're in person. I want this to feel like we're just hanging out, having a conversation in person, like we've known each other. And that's why another thing I try to do is. Well, I'll reach out to you. And then once I actually get you on here, before I start, I try to talk to the person for five, 10 minutes. Sometimes it's longer just to get the person, especially if they've never done an interview before, get them comfortable. If they've never been on a podcast, you know, get them kind of comfortable. So where once we, once I hit record, it's just boom, you go and you're ready for it. Of course, my doves are getting chatty right now. <laughs> I heard yeah. that in the background. Early. Yeah, I, I have white doves, part of my magic stuff. Oh, nice. Um, they just had a baby a little while ago. It's now actually looking like a dove. For a while, it was this like chicken looking monster little thing, but now it has full white feathers and is flying. So it's a quarantine baby, though. It was conceived and raised during this uh, process. It's such a quick process. It's not like a human. It's uh, two and a half weeks of in an egg and then like two and a half weeks or like two weeks and then it's out of the nest. So it's like, Four and a half weeks later, and the baby is flying. Nice. It's crazy. Now, are they trained? Like, I'm as far as like if you had them out of the cage, or how does? Uh, it... Right now, uh, I'm still fairly new into magic, so not as. But I'm working with them to okay. to do more things. I have like various props and stuff that are um, that will utilize them quite a bit. They mostly just appear and disappear. That's okay. it, mostly how dove magic works. It's a lot of like there's fire and then there's a dove mm -hmm. there's a balloon there he's a dove that kind of stuff it's a lot of like them in small spaces and now they're here <laughs> nice but um no that i'm trying to get them to train to fly to a specific place that's what i'm working on with them right now is to be able to be out of the cage so that if i make them appear i can just send them backstage and they'll land on the one post and then go in their travel mm -hmm. container as opposed to me having to uh freak 
out. <laughs> yes, yes. And have them uh, like fly to the rafters or, or fly over the audience or land mm -hmm. on somebody's head, which again, they're not going to hurt them, but it still would be better for everybody if they listen. They go, exactly. If they go, and they're smart ish they're birds but they're smart -ish. it's kind of like when you have children you bring them somewhere like okay when we get here behave you want don't act up you don't want them acting up anywhere at home but you rather them act up at home like your birds for example you rather them act up at home than out in public and exactly which is why here's the training space and we're yes. able to work with them and then uh, out there hopefully they won't and it's a similar thing with with kids except kids are smarter is that um you know, if we get separated, we meet back here. It's the logic of where I'm trying to train these birds to go to. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like if I tell if you start flying that direction, fly to that thing. Don't. Yes. Yeah. That's no. your safe place. You'll I be safe. Get it. There. I get. Um, it. No, but yeah. So a lot of and a lot, and that's why I approach that. I've always had a passion for magic too, but I approach them all magic and filmmaking and everything i do from that same like entertainment perspective it's all mm -hmm. about entertaining people in any medium i can do i i used to act i used to do theater stuff i want to be opposed to doing more of that again like as long as it was in the realm i think i was put here to entertain and i think be it filmmaking or uh documentaries live action animation i would love to do a lot of different projects. And I have ideas everywhere. It's just, you know, getting things done is always the hard thing. It's like, you know, things aren't, films aren't cheap to, to make. Even if they're cheaper, it's still, you know, $80,000. Not everyone has, I don't have $80,000 lying around to just make another low budget film. So even if you want to do something that level, you still have to find it and then, that's very hard to do. They're inside kind of a budget. It's very hard to do. To Helen Back had a lot more money than 80000 to do, and it was still a low-budget project. So I'm hoping with the next project to go higher than both of these. But we'll see what happens. Paper's cheap right now, so I'm trying to... I'm writing on the idea of we can always tone down later, but I'd rather aim to have a million millions of dollars in money and then have to bring it down to a million yeah. then aim to have a million and then be given a hundred thousand to make it <laughs> yep. doable like doable but but harder yeah There's a lot of challenges shooting movies really cheap and really fast because there's a lot of compromises and you can make it work they're inside we're able to make it work but there are a lot of things if we had had double or triple or quadruple the money, we could have done so much, yeah, better or more with. It would have probably been a very similar movie, but we would have been able to fix a lot of the problems without having to um, fix them in post. But fixing things sometimes in post, especially with found footage, allows you to also, you have to really be creative with it. Mm -hmm. And I think we were able to make a lot of changes that no one who watches it will know were changes, but we we like revamped the whole story in post. And it's a crazy concept to think you shoot a movie, a dialogue heavy movie, and then mm -hmm. are able to change big chunks of it in the editing bay, but that happens with every project. Yeah, A movie's written and then rewritten in, in the editing bay. Like the movies are written twice. Once in, in a by a screenwriter and once by the editor. And going back to what you said about entertaining, I feel, I feel the same way. Like I'm here to entertain and maybe just, maybe my calling is with the horror podcast, getting these awesome interviews with people because I do, I did, does feel like it's really natural. And again, it's something that I'm really passionate about. It's not something like I, and the funny thing is when I first started this podcast, right. I actually, before this podcast, I started doing like, the, you know, like the horror boxes, doing like unboxings of those on Facebook Live. I'll do those in my horror group. Yeah. And I went from that to, I kept saying, I was like, one of these days I'm going to start a horror podcast. One of these days I'm going to do a podcast. My wife kept saying, why don't you just do it? And I told her, I was like, I don't, you know, I had the camera, that same camera I have now, which I do eventually want to upgrade. But I had the camera I have now, but I had a USB mic. And I told her, I was like, when I do this, I said, I want to have like a nice little mixer 
I just, I was like, I don't, I, you don't need it, podcasters. You don't need the mixer, but it's just something I wanted. And so one day I'm at work and she ordered me a mixer, my, like my first mixer, which I still have put away now, ordered me a mixer, came with the mixer, a mic and headphones and got delivered. She, I'm at work and she sends me a picture of this. And I'm just like, I was thinking, I was so excited, but I'm like, should I act like I'm six so I can go home and start messing with this now? <laughs> and like it from then on, like I would, at first I would just record, which I still have them on, like my cousins, my brothers, just like friends, pe- local people. And it went from that to pretty much what it is now over the year. And I remember my, well, that's the thing I bought, like when this whole thing started and I started having to do a lot more stuff digitally, I, I used to do all these interviews just with my MacBook mm-hmm. mic. The camera I use is the same. Sometimes I'll put on one of these lenses you just buy for your cell phone because okay. it works right on with the webcam, gives me a much broader view. So if I'm doing like, like right now underneath me is like a close-up map for magic stuff so that I put on the lens, I don't have to move the computer or mic or anything, but it all of a sudden gives me that up lens where I can see the uh, – the, because I do a lot of things virtually, they can see the whole close-up map. So I, when I, as I'm learning things with the teacher, because we can't do in person, mm-hmm. they see the, the whole math without having to. So this is my little setup right now that I use for, for interviews. It's the same setup where I shot that little short film the other couple of days right here with the same computer, same mic. Uh, but like I bought like a mic like this, just a USB yeah. one. Um, but the quality is honestly pretty good. Um, oh. Usually there's a, the sound, as you know, from the beginning, uh, my turtle tank is is because I'm in an apartment, so like my uh, this is my dining room, but it ends up being like my magic corner slash podcast area, and uh, like I have doves over here, turtles over here, <laughs> so like it's it isn't always perfect audio, but you know, I understand. Yeah, you got, you, but the, you know what it is. Like, I like what you're doing because you're not using the excuse of like, oh well. I can't do it because, you know, my doves are in here because the, the turtle tank, I know you turn the thing off the filter, but the turtle tanks in here or whatever the case may be. Yeah. You're doing what you can in, in that area. Like for me, I'm in the attic and like, it's quieter up here. I have my setup up here. I would love to be in like, you know, a regular room to where I'm in the regular room, you know, with the flat roof and all that and the straight up wall. So I can have my green screen really spread out. But I, I, you do what you do to make it work. And I look at it as another thing is it's like, once I do, once we do move into another home that we own of our own and we, I have that extra room to do my stuff, I'll be that much better at it because I'm right now making this area work. So I know once I have a... Agreed, a yeah. Once you're able to actually put a room together and that's the same logic with, with, with me, I'll probably, when I have a, a place that isn't an apartment or, or my, an apartment that's just mine, I'll probably put, make a room that's just for like this kind of, like a home office where I can have my because i do in my bedroom have like a a desk with like my editing computer and the second monitor and like all Mm -hmm. that and but even in there you know i have i have a lot of animals so in there i have my dog and my chameleon and my mouse and i fish yeah a lot of animals no i (laughs) i no i get it though and it's just it it's just like I said, it's going to make you better at your craft in the long run. Agreed. You're, making, you're making this work. And then once you get into that room where you're like, holy shit, I have this whole room, this whole space, the lighting, you know, yeah. my, the lights, the lighting's perfect. Everything's perfect for it. All I got to do is literally hook my stuff up and plug in and play and boom, go. Agreed. But um, yeah, this was, this was a great interview, man. I'm so glad. Right, you thank you. Here. I'm so honored you came on here. I greatly appreciate you coming on here. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, I definitely love to come back once I have something else going on uh, (laughs) to promote. You can even come on just to review a horror movie with me one day. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, we can pick something. I've done that before on another one. Pick a movie, we both watch it, and then we review it. That sounds fun. Because, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I would love to have you on here again, like later, you know, say a few months down the road. Yeah, see where, see where we're both at from there. But I'd love to have you on a lot sooner and just review a movie, and you know, kind of go from there. Sounds good. But uh, I guess we can wrap it up. I do want to talk to you after we're done recording for a couple more. Yeah, minutes. of course. Yeah. But if there's anything you want to plug, feel free to go. This is the time. Feel free to plug. Yeah. So um, 
I have, you can buy on Blu-ray or uh, watch on Amazon Prime, eat, tell them back in there inside. Um, I have a, a, a short up right now. It's on my YouTube channel. Just Derek Dennis Herbert, um, you, my YouTube channel for the alone. It's called otherwise social media, Derek Dennis Herbert, Derek D. Herbert on Twitter and Instagram and Master of the Macabre Entertainment on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's mm -hmm. my company. Um, for any like bigger updates, it'll be on there. And yeah, so a lot of cool things in the works, but nothing really to talk about yet. Um, a short film I'm prepping to shoot as soon as this is over. A series of five music videos, short film I'm making for an up-and-coming musician, Cade King, and then a feature that I'm writing right now. So some cool things in the works. Awesome. And yeah, um, when you get a chance, shoot me like all your links, and when I put this, will, out, yeah, I'll drop you know I'll drop them in the description and stuff and all that good thing, mm -hmm. all that. But yeah, everybody check this out. Go follow Derek. He's an awesome, awesome guy. Oh, and tell him back's on Shutter as well now. Yes, which is the platform it always should have been on, and I'm excited it's on there. Yes, tell him back is on Shutter. Watch it. Not only watch it on Shutter, go just go buy it, people. Just buy the story <laughs> of it because it's it's worth it, and it's one of those things where like, I mean, even if you buy it and you never watch it, let me hang on, let me finish. And you want to buy it to get it signed? Watch it on Shutter and get this signed and just put it away in your collection i'm probably gonna i know i'm gonna get it and get it signed and probably watch the blu-ray and watch it on shutter that's just but yes you guys it's, it's a great it's an excellent documentary i also recommend getting the book i yes, can't wait to see what, Mike and I can't wait to see what uh, derek has in store for us later on can we watch yes we can watch i'm gonna check this movie out and again man thank you so much for coming on greatly appreciate it i had a great time with you and me too Everybody else, you should know where to find me, my listeners. But if not, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Spotify, I'm on Podbean, All Horror Research 30. Anywhere you can listen to a podcast, you can hear me. And then you'll also be able to see me on video now. Um, my Twitch name, I do stream, horror underscore with underscore sir underscore 30. Twitch just, you can't do spaces with Twitch, I do underscores. Um, I have a Facebook group and a Facebook page. My Facebook group is for anybody and everybody to go in there, share anything and everything horror related, including your own projects, Horror Research 30, the group. The Horror Research 30 page is more for, you know, updates from me. I post it in the group and the page, but it gets lost in the shuffle in the group because everybody posts in there. But, you know, if you want to check something out, episodes, everything gets posted in the, in the page as far as like what, my, what I'm doing. If I'm watching a certain movie, stuff like that if i'm going to a con my youtube videos it's all on the page and as well like, again it's in the group as well but it gets lost in the shuffle so join the group and again if you want to be on this podcast shoot me an email horror with sir dot sturdy at gmail.com thank you all for listening and as always i'll see you in your nightmare